particularly inspired by lately is a woman named Inez Milholland. You probably haven't heard of her, but she was a fiery, radiant, empowered, strong woman, a lawyer and a social activist back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And people have said that she was ahead of her time, but she was of her time because there have been strong, empowered women who have helped shape our collective history in every time. They just don't all make it into our textbooks. So I'd like to share with you a little excerpt from a speech that Inez gave in, in Los Angeles. And the backstory is the year was 1916. It'll be 100 years in, uh, next year. And it was an election year. And she was really, um, so she was a peace, she had just come back from being a peace um, correspondent for World War I in Italy. She just turned 30. And she came back to renew her work with the women's suffrage movement. She was working to get women equal voting rights with men as equal citizens. And she agreed, she was just totally exhausted from, from this trip, um, but she agreed to a grueling speech tour of giving 50 speeches in 30 days, traveling throughout for, from New York by train to the 11 western states where women did have the right to vote. So, um, so thousands of women and men were flocking to hear her speak, and she was just you know, going by, by night trains to reach the next destination. She was totally exhausted and depleted, but just still really pouring her heart and soul into this work. And um, I'd like to share with you her last, a piece of her last speech, which she gave here in Los Angeles. And I offer this with deepest respect and gratitude for Inez, for her work, and for the work of all the suffragists, and really anyone who is helping taking action on behalf of equal rights for all. If democracy means anything. It means a right to a voice in government. Women are as deeply concerned as men in foreign policy. Whether we are to have a civil or militaristic future is of deepest moment to us. We know and must help to decide whether our sons are to be trained to peace or war. We say to the government, you shall not educate our children to citizenship or soldierdom without our wisdom and advice. You shall no longer make laws that burden us with taxes and high prices, or that regulate our lives, our homes, our transportation and education of children until we are free to act with you. This is our demand. This is why we place suffrage before all other national issues. This is why we ask women to rise in revolt against that party that has ignored the pleas of women for self-government and against any party that ignores the claims of women until we win. Women of the West, will you make this fight? Will you take this stand? Will you battle for your fellow women who are not yet free? We have no one but you to depend on. Men have made it plain that they will fight for us only when it is worth their while, and you must make it worth their while is only for a little while. Soon the battle will be over. Victory is in sight. It depends upon how we stand in this coming election, united or divided, whether we shall win, and whether we shall deserve to win. We have no money of our own, no elaborate organization, no one interested in our success, except anxious-hearted women all over the country who cannot come to the battle line themselves. Here and there, in, in, in the factory and in farmhouse, by the fireside, in hospitals and schoolrooms, wherever women are sorrowing and working and hoping they are praying for our success. Women of these states unite. 
We have only our chains to lose and a whole nation to gain. Doctors came from, from the packed house to revive her. And when they did, she insisted on finishing the speech. And then she was taken immediately to the hospital. And a month later, she died in the hospital at age 30. 